Well, it's good to be in worship with everyone today. What a beautiful day. You know, it's kind of a challenge to preach when it's so beautiful outside and hold everyone's attention. And then to top things off, your DCE brings a pillow to your sermon. So, you know, if I look over this way, don't be using that, all right? But uh, if anybody wants to borrow it, I'm sure she could set you up with a deal. You guys ever received a gift? Maybe you've had this experience where you receive a gift and it seems like the gift is a lot more work than it's worth. And uh, you find yourself sarcastically saying something like, boy, this is the gift that just keeps on giving, but it really keeps on taking. Let me give you a couple examples, okay? So imagine somebody uh, out of love gives you a $50 gift certificate to a nice restaurant. And you're like, wow, this is really cool. This is really nice of them to think of us. But upon examining the certificate, you realize it wasn't the restaurant that is in town that you thought it was. No, instead, it's a restaurant that you have to drive 138 miles to to be able to have dinner. But, you know, you have a gift certificate, so you're willing to take the little extra four-hour or two-hour, whatever it is, to get there and back. And as you get there, you realize as you're setting up the reservation that they're only open during the day, not during evenings. And so it will have to be a lunch instead of an evening. So you're going to have to take a personal day off of work, right? But that's okay because you have your $50 gift certificate. You need to do that. And then when you get to the restaurant, you see that there's a sign saying that you need to wear a shirt and tie to get into this place. You don't have a shirt and tie on, but you can conveniently buy one for $75 in their gift shop. And so you put out the money for that and you finally sit down to have your lunch and the waiter says, just so you know, there's a $150 minimum to all lunches. You would say, boy, this is the gift that just keeps on giving, isn't it? Or for example, if you're like a, a young couple and, and some friends say, you know, we'd love to take your, your three children for the weekend so you can have some time alone. You'd say, that's awesome, right? You'd jump for that, right? Problem is, is that these people who offer this say, yeah, all you got to do is uh, we live in New York, so just you and the kids fly out to LaGuardia and then transfer over to JFK and then take the public transportation into Queens and drop them off at our house on Friday and then come back to the UP and then on Sunday repeat the process again. And you would say, yeah, this is the gift that keeps on giving. Or what if your boss gave you an extra day off of work for some R&R, rest and relaxation? But everywhere you went in town to relax, your boss was there kind of watching you and saying, I don't know if I'd be doing that. I don't know if you're doing resting correctly. You know, you'd say, wow, I'm so glad I got this extra gift from my boss. Well, that last instance is a little bit like the story we see in Mark's gospel today. You you see, in all these stories, it's like somebody's giving you a gift But the gift becomes more demanding than it really is worth. And today in in the Gospel of Mark, we are continuing our summer series, and we're looking at episode two, which is Sabbath shenanigans, right? As we see that God is giving the gift of the Sabbath to the people, but the Pharisees of the day are accusing the disciples of Jesus for not doing things correctly, and this gift that God gives of the Sabbath, is a, it's a beautiful gift. In fact, every gift God gives. God never gives a gift that is demanding and takes more than it gives, right? In fact, the Bible verbatim says, God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. And so his gifts are, are cherry, they're pristine, they're perfect, right? If there's a problem with a gift... It's not from the giver who is God. The problem comes when we who receive the gift maybe misuse or twist or misinterpret its intentional desires that God has for it. And you can see this in a lot of areas of our lives, can't you? Let me give you a few examples. The gift of sexual intimacy is a wonderful gift that God blessed husbands and wives with to express their love for one another And when it's God's will to bring about the procreation and care of children, right? And yet it's that same gift, misused and twisted by humanity, that creates a $12 billion a year pornography industry. Or let's take the gift of food. It's a wonderful gift for fellowship with families and friends as we come around a table and, and, and enjoy each other's presence, but it's also the same gift that can create uh, gluttony and, and, and eating disorders that need to be uh, addressed and, and dealt with. 
Even the Bible talks about wine being a good gift. I mean, there's actually a story where they ran out once and Jesus made more, right? And yet from that same gift can come drunkenness and uh, lascivious behavior and the like. And so it is with the Sabbath. God gives the good and perfect gift of the day of rest. It is beautiful. It is holy. But those who put themselves in charge of taking care of the Sabbath made it twisted, and they misinterpreted in the very presence of Jesus that day. But we can go back to the very beginning of the story of the creation of of the heavens and the earth, and we see that the Sabbath rest was part of God's original intention, even at the beginning. There in Genesis 2, it says that, thus the heavens and earth were completed in all their vast array, and then on the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing, So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And then God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy because on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. Look at those key words there. God rested. God blessed. God made it holy. It was a good and and perfect gift. And sure, there were some prescriptions to abstain from work, There was some allowances to spend time with God so that you could create some space in your life to allow God's spirit to work in you and to recreate, to rejuvenate, to revive all things that I would think we as fast-paced American people would appreciate, right? God knew the type of lives we would find ourselves living and he knew he needed to build margin into our lives. But this day of rest was never a heavy-handed gift that demanded from you, but rather it blessed you with God's very presence and with his peace. And so that was the original design. A God who needs not to rest modeled rest for us, even in the creative process. And then later in God's word, you can go to Exodus and you can see that It's a little more specific about how six days is what God gives us to work, but on the seventh day, they were not to work. And why is that? Well, that is so that the ox and the donkey may rest, the animals, and so that the servants who are working in your household can rest, and even the foreigner who might be living among you in the neighborhood, that they could be refreshed, that all people, see, this wasn't just for the Jewish people, but it was for all people. And notice those operative words again there. God does it so that people could rest and be refreshed. But as I said earlier, however, like all good gifts, sinful humankind misused, misinterpreted, and twisted its true intentions. In fact, they were doing this even during the time of the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard of the book. It's called the Talmud. It's it's a book of Jewish traditions, okay? So it's not Scripture, but it's a bunch of words that people who follow the Old Testament scriptures wrote in there as traditions. And so in a way, it's kind of like a a commentary or additional thoughts that we think would be good, (laughs) as though God didn't give us the good thoughts already. But anyways, uh, it's well intended. But what's interesting about the Talmud, there's 24 chapters on Sabbath regulations, You would have thought it's just pretty simple, but no, it got very complicated. And even in the time of Jesus, they were operating off this same owner's manual, right? And so there are 24 chapters, but I just want to kind of share with you like four or five just to show the level of intricacies and and detail and legalism that comes about in this rule, this law. So on the Sabbath in the Talmud, they said you couldn't travel more than 3,000 steps from your, feet, from your house because somehow they came up with, you know, 2,900 was not traveling, but 3,000 was. So you had to always kind of plan out what you were doing on that day. You were not to carry anything weighing more than a dried fig. I don't know how much that weighs, but you weren't supposed to carry more than that. You couldn't carry a needle with you lest you might be tempted to sew. I always stay away from that one because I'm always tempted to sew, so I never carry a needle. Plus, I can poke myself. So that's a good one. This one's a good one, too. You were not allowed to take a bath on the Sabbath because the water might splash and accidentally wash the floor. And then my, my personal favorite, don't shoot the messenger, 
Uh, the Talmud said that women could not look in the mirror on the Sabbath because they might pull out a gray hair and less be guilty of reaping on the Sabbath. And so um, these are real things that they had kind of extrapolated and made legalisms to what God had placed. Kind of remind me of a story when uh, my brother was uh, getting his doctorate at uh, Johns Hopkins, and, and he was staying in Baltimore in, a, in an apartment. And on the same floor in the apartment there, uh, he had some uh, neighbors who were Hasidic Jews. Well, one Saturday, he had a knock on the door, and he went to answer the door, and they said, you know, we think our pilot light went out in our oven. It smells like gas in our apartment. And my brother says, oh. They said, because it's the Sabbath, we're not allowed to relight the pilot. My brother said, oh, okay. And he said, so you need me to go over there and light it? He says, well, technically, we can't even ask you to go light it. But they were knocking on his door, letting him know what was going on. So it just kind of showed that, that the intention and the way things get carried out were not always uh, in the same vein. And so you can imagine the Pharisees with their false indignation, right? Coming along when they see Jesus and his disciples picking grain from the wheat field and taking some of the heads of grain. To them, that was a major violation. And by the Pharisees' interpretation, they were not just accusing them of, they weren't really accusing them of stealing. Uh, they were accusing them of actually working, right? So, so if you look at it, we're kind of doing an Old Testament, um, an Old Testament uh, survey today, but uh, I'm going to have us all read this together as I grab a drink of water. Let's go on three. One, two, three. If you enter your neighbor's vineyard, Oh, you guys are good at that. You can do the rest of my sermon here. That's awesome. So, um, but, but look at this. This is actually, <clears throat> this is in the scriptures, that you are allowed to actually pick grapes. You are allowed to, um, to actually go through your neighbor's grain field. You could pick with your hands. You just couldn't, couldn't get the sick. You couldn't start up the combine, okay, right? And, and, and those of you who grew up on a farm, right, if you had a farm and, and somebody was walking on your property line and there was maybe an apple hanging over the barbed wire fence, you wouldn't be upset with a neighbor taking an apple off the tree and eating it. I mean, I think as kids, we all did that, right? But if all of a sudden you're there shaking their tree with gunny sacks and they come back the next day and their whole tree is down, but you got lots of apples for your deer, right? No, that's, that's, that's not cool. That's stealing at that point. And so, so we see that this, this law was in place, but uh, the disciples uh, were guilty of working. And so Jesus goes to bat for them. And he defends them in three very succinct ways. He says, first of all, listen to this. He goes, in the Old Testament, don't you remember when David had to bend the rules? Don't you remember when David, during the time of Abiathar and Abimelech, they ate the presents, the bread of presents off the table that only the priests ate? Then he goes, secondly, don't you understand the true intention of the law, the true spirit of the law, as we heard in Mark's gospel today? The Sabbath was made for man, and man was not made for the Sabbath. The, the gift was never intended to demand more from us than it was to give us. And in fact, in Matthew's gospel, he goes a little further and he says, how many of you hypocrites don't pull out your ox or your lamb or your sheep or something that falls into a well and say, well, it's the Sabbath, I can't. How many of you who get your four-wheel drive stuck in the mud don't call the tow truck on the Sabbath, but you have to wait a day? No, he says, you guys are hypocrites because whenever it comes to saving life, that trumps your interpretation of the Sabbath. And finally, Jesus points to his own authority. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And the Lord of the Sabbath trumps all things that you might think. In fact, he's the one who made the Sabbath rule, so you can't catch him on the rules. You remember when you used to try to catch your parents in a rule? Like, well, you said this is your, and your parent goes, don't try to quote my rules back to me. They're my rules. I understand them. They're my, I made them. You can't miss it. This is Jesus. He's the Lord. He understands the rule, and he understands how it's to be applied because he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and he's the Lord of all. And so these Pharisees try to expand the laws, right? But even if the law was constricted back to its original purpose, 
we still, as God's people, would not be able to keep it. We would not be able to observe it or follow it because we are, we are stained with sin. And so what you need to take with you today is that our hope is not in following the Sabbath. Our hope is in following the Lord of the Sabbath, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, because he's the one who perfectly fulfilled all laws and regulations. He's the one who perfectly lived his life for you, where we have misused his gifts in the past and in the present. Jesus did not. And all of that righteousness is accredited to you. All of that sits in your account. All of that is the reflection of what God sees when he sees you. He sees Jesus. And because of that, we have a wonderful gift of eternal life because of what our Savior did. Taking on the curse of the law, nailing it to the cross. As it says there in in Colossians, we realize that we are no longer defined by what the law says, but we are defined by what the gospel says of us, that God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all of your sins. And then Paul goes on to say, so therefore, don't let anybody judge you. Don't let them judge you by what you eat or drink. Don't let them judge you by regard to any religious festivals. Don't let them judge you to a new moon celebration, or even a Sabbath day, right? These are shadows of the things that were to come, but the reality, however, is found in Christ. And that's what we take with us today, that our reality is in our Savior Jesus Christ. Our object of worship is in our Savior Jesus. He is our rest. He is the one that says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I, Jesus, will give you rest. And so take that rest and that peace today that we are here with our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of heavens and earth, and the Lord of all things. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you rested on the seventh day as a model for the way our lives would be constructed. And Lord, as we look to you for our ultimate rest, we pray that you would help us to be recreated in you, Lord, as we turn our hearts and our attention to what you have done for us and how you are with us and how your spirit is inside of us. Lord, bless us through this day of worship Help us to be recreated, help us to be rejuvenated, and help us to be rested because we are in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.